dear friends today we look at the third lecture on the course of dynamics of ocean structures we will talk about environmental loads in the previous lectures we discussed about the structural action of various type of offshore structures their design philosophies their form based designs etc in this lecture we will talk about what are those forces which will act on ocean structures just as a glimpse we already said that offshore structures are divided into three categories fixed type complaint type and floating type we have already seen in detail what are the functional requirements and form based demands in these type of structures where do they operate etc in the last two lectures now let us talk about different varieties of loads which come on offshore structures there are essentially five categories of loads permanent loads or dead loads which is abbreviated as pl operating loads or live loads which can be called as ll other environmental loads like earthquake loads called as ol construction and installation loads and finally the accidental loads let's quickly see one by one how they can be estimated what are the governing equations we saw the spectrums being respectively used to estimate these forces we we'll start with the wind force we'll start from the top the exposed surface of the platform like drilling derricks living quarters helipad flare booms etc will be those structural systems which generally attract wind forces we already must understand that offshore structures are designed in such a manner that the superstructure is essentially kept transparent for wind forces wind force on offshore structure are essentially caused by complex aerodynamic phenomena it is rather very difficult to calculate them with high accuracy then how wind force are caused when stream of air flows through with constant velocity v it will generate a force on the flat plate whose area is a remember the area here is not the cross section area but the area of exposure generally the area of exposure is considered normal or orthogonal to the flow direction therefore this force will be now proportional and it will normal to the area of exposure and that value will be proportional to a v square where a is the exposed area and v is the velocity of wind the proportionality constant to estimate this force remember is very important it is independent of the area which is specified by experimental studies therefore the equation given below will tell you to estimate wind force on a plate which is kept orthogonal to the wind flow direction obviously in this equation c w v and rho a can be those estimates which are to be calculated mass density is nothing but the rho a which is taken as 1.25 kg per cubic meter mass density of air increases due to the water spray because of the splash effect up to the height of 20 meters above the mean sea level now once you know the pressure which is the net wind pressure acting normal to the plate area now i can find out the force which is given by the equation given below which is rho w into the exposed area or pw into exposed area so pw is the one which is calculated from the above equation and area a is what we have already calculated now if the wind is not orthogonal to the plate or vice versa the plate is not normal to the direction of flow direction of wind then use appropriate projected area which is normal to the flow direction the wind pressure coefficient cw in the previous equation is generally control stationary wind flow conditions in a wind tunnel it is computed experimentally it depends on the reynolds number rn the typical value which is being used in offshore design is varying from 0.7 to 1.2 for cylindrical members essentially you must appreciate by this time now that most of the offshore structural members are cylindrical in shape natural wind has got two components one is the mean wind component which is a static component the other one is a fluctuating component we call this as gust component and technically speaking this component is a dynamic component now gust component is generated by turbulence of flow field in all three 
spatial directions respectively x y and z planes. Now, the wind velocity has got two components as we expressed here one is the mean wind component which is static the other one is the gust component which is varying with time which is dynamic. V bar in this equation is what we call mean wind velocity and V t is called the gust component. Wind force consists of two parts one is the drag component other is the lift component. The direction parallel to the flow is called as a drag force and the one which is normal to the flow is called as a lift force which are given by these two expressions as shown in the slide now. Now, we generally use a wind spectrum above water surface which is given by 1 7 power law as given by this equation where in this equation V z is a wind speed at any elevation z meter above the mean sea level whereas, V 10 is considered as the wind speed at 10 meter above the MSL where this 10 meter is called as a reference height from the data. Power law remember friends it is purely empirical, but however is most widely used. So, force due to wind is given by this equation of summarizing the previous equations together in one half rho a c w v square a we already know the components of rho a c w v and a etcetera and we already know that v has got two components the static component and the gust component you try to expand this equation and neglecting higher powers of the gust component you have a simplified value like this. Now, the wind force is therefore, expressed as a mean component of wind and the gust component. Now, wind being considered as an ergodic process the one sided power spectral density function of the wind process is then related to the wind spectrum as given with this equation as you see in the slide now. After understanding how to compute the wind forces from the desired spectrum, let us talk about the next major environmental load coming on offshore structure which is wave forces. Wind generated sea surface waves can be represented by a combination of different regular waves as shown in the slide. Regular waves of different magnitude and wavelengths from different directions are combined together to represent the sea surface elevation that is a general phenomenon. Aries wave theory is most commonly used as a preliminary theory because it assumes linearity between the kinematic quantities and the wave height. Aries theory assumes a sinusoidal form as you see in the figure here where h is the height from the crest to the trough that is what we call as the wave height which is very small in comparison to the wavelength which is varying from one specific point on the wave to the corresponding point on the next wave. So, this is what we call as the wavelength and wave height is generally small in comparison to the wave length and of course, d represents water depth and capital D will represent the member diameter. In this equation c is called wave celerity which is expressed in meter per second. Now, Aries wave theory is valid only till the mean sea level. So, Aries wave theory straight away gives you the sur sea surface elevation which is eta x of t as given by this equation where k is called as the wave number and lambda is the wave length as we know and u dot, u double dot, v dot and v double dot or respectively the horizontal water particle velocity and acceleration and vertical water particle velocity and acceleration respectively which is derived from as a function of the sea surface elevation which is given by Aries linear wave theory. It is linear because it assumes linearity between the wave height and the wave water particle kinematics. Now, due to the variable submergence effect one can ask me a question what is variable submergence effect please understand here in this picture that this is my still water level if the cylinder of the member remains exactly here and the water level remains static as horizontal then there is no variation of the wave width with respect to the immersion level of the cylinder. But however, 
the wave is not horizontal, but it follows a crest and trough as you see here. Therefore, when the cylinder is static at a specific place, as the wave passes through the cylinder, some portion of the cylinder will immerse more and some will immerse less. This is what we call as variable submergence effect. The submerged length of the member will continuously now change. Therefore, the kinematics need to be modified if we really wanted to include the wave submergence effect which is given by Chakravarti's modification. Chakravarti's modification suggests there is a difference in the horizontal water particle velocity and acceleration as you see in the equation given here. In this expression except everything already explained d here is the water depth measured from the mean sea level. So, k denotes the wave number omega denotes the wave circular frequency and of course, f denotes the cyclic frequency which is inverse of the period of wave. Now, to estimate the water particle kinematics that is nothing but the horizontal and vertical water particle velocity and acceleration there are different wave theories available in the literature linear or first order Aries theory, Stokes fifth order theory, solitary wave theory, conoidal wave theory, Dean stream function theory, numer numerical theory given by Chaplier. The linear wave theory can be applied only when the specific condition is satisfied where h by g t square is less than 0 0.01 and d by g t square is greater than 0 0.05. Now, this chart which is shown in the slide now will be a governing chart for selecting the corresponding wave theory depending upon the two corresponding ratios h by g t square and d by g t square for a given wave period, for a given water depth, for a given wave height you know the vertical and horizontal axis values. Based on this you will know which theory you want to follow linear theory, Stokes second order, canoidal theory, shallow water theory etcetera. So, one can select any relevant theory and from the theory one can estimate the horizontal and vertical water particle velocity and acceleration. Alternatively you also have spectrums to designate the wave loads. The famous spectrum as you see here is S omega as given with the expression given here where alpha in this equation is known as Phillips constant which value is 0 0.0081. Subsequent to this Pearson Moskowitz has proposed a spectrum which is modified and with two parameters H s and omega naught as you see here. We also use international ship structures congress specified spectrum which is also a two parameter spectrum H s and omega bar which is famously known as I s S C spectrum as given by this equation whereas, in this equation omega bar is the ratio of m 1 by m naught where m 1 m naught are all called spectral moments of the spectrum. We also have something called John Spratt spectrum which is a 5 parameter spectrum H s omega naught gamma tau a and tau b and the equation is available in the screen now where in this case nu is known as the picketness parameter and sigma bar is a spectral width parameter as used here which can be used to compute the limits between sigma b and sigma a bar. The Phillips constant as you see here earlier is subsequently modified and therefore, the nu is also modified for a given value and the variation of nu is from 1 to 7. With the help of all these spectrum available in the literature one can know the forces coming on offshore members. Let us see how these forces can be computed on offshore members. Froud Kirillov force is essentially caused by the pressure effects due to the undisturbed incident waves. Diffraction force is also caused by the pressure effects due to the presence of structure in the fluid flow domain. Hydrodynamic added mass and potential damping forces are caused by the pressure effects due to the motion of the structural components in ideal flow field. Viscous drag force is caused by the pressure effects due to relative velocity between the water particle and the structural component. For slender structures the Froude Kirillov force and the diffraction force are idealized 
by a single inertia term. Let us quickly see what is the governing equation which tells me to estimate force on a horizontal cylinder which is available in the screen now. Force on a vertical cylinder will be given by the velocity potential and the dynamic pressure variation as seen in the equations in the slide now. The horizontal force per unit length is therefore, given by the expression as you see here. This reduces to the following conventional form where C h accounts for the diffraction effects in the regime. Now, forces on the members of different geometric shapes using froud kloff theory is available and summarized in a tabular form where the value of C h is also recommended by the theory. For different basic shapes as horizontal cylinder, horizontal half cylinder, vertical cylinder, rectangular block, hemisphere and sphere, the horizontal force is given by this equation and the vertical force is given by these equations, where the horizontal coefficient and the vertical coefficient are given by these two respective columns, whereas the range applicable to these equations are available in the last column. In this equation, V stands for the submerged volume of the structure, C h and C v as explained are the force coefficients in the horizontal and vertical directions respectively. Now, we have understood how to compute the wind force acting on the superstructure, how to compute the wave force acting on the immersed section of the force body. Now, let us talk about the presence of current forces on members. Current velocity is generally added vectorially to the horizontal water particle velocity before computing the drag force. Drag force depends on the square of the water particle velocity. Current decreases slowly with the increase in depth, but even small magnitude of current velocity can cause significant drag force. Therefore, you must add current velocity vectorially before you compute the drag force, because drag force is square of the water particle velocity. So, remember that. Steepening of the wave profile changes wave celerity, current makes the structure itself to generate waves, this in turn creates additional diffraction forces. Now, the presence of current is alternatively accounted also by generally increasing the wave height by about 10 to 15 percent. The second kind of force which also acts on the offshore structural member is the earthquake forces. One can ask me a question how earthquake loads become important in offshore structures. Friends, as we all agree and understand by this time that when offshore structural system is bottom supported, that is when they rest on the seabed, for example, gravity based structures, for example, jacket or template structures which are held down in position by piles or resting on piles, the sea quakes happening at the seabed are transferred directly to that of the members. However, when the members are floating or when the structure of the platform is compliant in nature, how earthquake forces do bother the platform is very important. Let us see the successive equations. Offshore platforms, those do not have stiff connection with the seabed are indirectly influenced by earthquakes. However, when they are bottom supported, they are affected directly by the earthquakes. Now, the complaint structures that are positioned restrained by tethers, for example, tension like platform will result in dynamic tether tension variations, because as we all know tethers are used to held down the platform in position. When the tethers are affected by the earthquake load superimposed on them, the tension in the tether changes. We call this as dynamic tether tension variation and this has occurred because of the presence of earthquake forces. The dynamic tether tension variation in turn will affect the response of the platform under later loads. Earthquake forces therefore, gives rise to the horizontal and vertical motions of a typical duration varying from 15 to 30 seconds. Earthquake forces accelerate random characteristics due to the nature of mechanism causing earthquakes, wave propagation, reflection and deflection. Earthquakes can result in inertia forces due to acceleration and damping forces due to motion of the water particle. Water waves generated during the ground motion are generally neglected in the study. Stiffness of the tether 
is modeled as an axial tension member, slackening of the teeth is generally neglected in the dynamic analysis. There are two spectrum generally given out of which the famous spectrum which is commonly used for seismic analysis of offshore complaint structures is Kanai Tazimi ground acceleration spectrum which is briefly called as KT spectrum. The equation is available there where S naught is called the intensity of earthquake which is given by this equation where omega g in this expression is called natural frequency of the ground motion, zeta g is the damping of the ground whereas, sigma g square is the variance <coughs> sigma g square is the variance of the ground acceleration. So, we have discussed about the aerodynamic loads or the wind loads acting on the superstructure. We talked about wave loads different wave theories very briefly and we discussed about couple of spectra commonly used in offshore structures. We talked about the current forces, we talked about the earthquake forces. The next is on the line is ice and snow loads. <laughs> ice loads are dominant in offshore structures in the arctic regions. Prediction of ice is generally associated with a significant degree of uncertainty because it depends upon whether the ice is a level ice, broken ice, is it an ice ridge or an ice berg because the impact caused by these are entirely different on the structural members. Offshore structures show different modes of failure under ice loads. They may result in creep failure, they may result in cracking, they may cause buckling, they may also result in spalling and crushing of concrete. Ice loads exhibit random variations in both space and time therefore, they are purely dynamic in nature. They are classified as either total or global loads, local or pressure variations. The global load effects cause the overall motion and affects the stability of the given platform whereas, the local loads cause members only at the connections. Now, in the levelized condition the frequency of interaction between the structure and the ice is very important because the number of interactions per unit time is important to quantify the ice loads on offshore structures. The total ice force can result in a periodic loading and can cause dynamic amplification in flexible and slender structures. The extreme static ice loads depends on geometric shape of the structure. Well designed cone shape can change the ice failure mode from crushing to that of bending. Factors which are commonly used for the design loads are for level ice it is 2, for first year ridge ice it is 5 and multi year ridge ice it is 7. There are 4 approaches available in the literature for addressing ice forces on offshore platforms. They are namely the experimental studies on scaled models, numerical studies based on field investigations and of course, data mining. If you look at the experimental studies scaling laws used are generally explainable to determine the ice loads and ice structure interaction considerably. Many advantages due to the capability of testing many types of structural shapes in large testing facilities has resulted in evolving these kind of equations. Of course, these tests are very expensive model ice not being accurately scaled as that of the sea ice. The ice failure is dependent on the geometric shape significantly and ice failure behavior therefore, cannot be accurately studied. It may lead to over prediction of ice loads. If you look at the numerical modeling of ice loads on offshore structures, this uses high end software to model ice forces for different interaction scenarios. This makes it very cost effective and instructive. Limited validation of results are available and comparable with that of experimental results. Therefore, they are very scarce in the literature. If you look at the estimate of ice loads, generally people use data mining or through field measurements. The excitations caused by ice loads is modeled as sinusoidal pseudo excitation and the response is characterized by an appropriate transfer function. The ice force spectrum on a narrow conical structure is given by the equation available on the screen now where the constants A and B used in this equation are 10 and 5.47 respectively F naught 
is the force amplitude on the structure T bar is called as the period of ice which is a ratio of L b over v where L b is ice breaking length which is typically 4 to 10 times of thickness of the ice where v is the velocity. Constants are values which are typically varying from 0 0.64, 3.5 and 2.5 respectively. Let us quickly see what is the force amplitude cost on the structure which is given by the equation available on the slide now where c is a constant sigma f is the bending strength of ice which is taken as 0.7 mega Pascal h in this equation represents the ice thickness d is the diameter of the ice cone and l c is the characteristic length of ice which is given in the equation below where in this equation e capital E is the Young's modulus of ice which is 0.5 giga Pascal and rho w the density of water is 1000 kg per cubic meter. Having said this another source of important load coming on offshore structure is marine growth. It is an additional deposit which grows along the circumferential length of the member which increases the diameter of the member. As the diameter of the member is increased start attracting more forces will create added mass to the structure the structure will become stiff will also result in corrosion. Marine growth or biofouling is an ubiquitous attachment of soft and hot particles on the surface of a submerged member. This ranges from seaweeds to hard shelled barnacles. The growth on the surface of the structure increases its diameter and of course, it affects its roughness very significantly. Wave forces on the members therefore, increases because of various reasons. One by increasing not only exposed area and volume, it also increases the drag coefficient because the roughness of the member increases. The drag coefficient changes due to higher surface roughness increases the unit mass of the member results in higher gravity loads and also it makes the member frequency slightly lower. The thickness of the marine growth can reach a maximum of about 0.3 meter or 300 mm sometimes it can be even more depending upon the geographic location. This is generally accounted in the design through appropriate increase in diameter and mass of the submerged members. Now, let us come to how to calculate mass in an offshore member. There are two kinds of mass what we will talk about in dynamic analysis one is what we call structural mass the other one is called hydrodynamic added mass of the structure. For a slender structure the structural mass is the mass of the displaced volume of the structure which will be significant because it is floating and slender structure and therefore, should be considered in the analysis. The added mass depends on submerged volume of the platform it varies with respect to the period of the vibration it is also due to the variation in buoyancy and it is also caused by change in teeth tension variation which affects the natural frequency of motion of the platform. Based on the equipment layout of the plan and chosen structural form one can easily compute the mass of the members and therefore, the whole platform readily. Desired proportion between the center of buoyancy and center of mass is maintained to ensure stability even under free floating conditions. Friends please understand that form based design is very important governing parameter in offshore structures because whatever may be a shape and size of the member you have to maintain a specific desired ratio between the center of buoyancy and center of mass if you really want to maintain a stability in the given platform even under free floating condition because if a complaint structure like TLP teethers are pulled off TLP should be able to remain stable in free floating conditions. The next aspect which comes in dynamic analysis is damping. Damping is nothing but a dissipating force it is proportional to velocity in this case there are variety of damping which we will talk about slightly later in the same module. For steel offshore structures structural damping is generally considered to vary from 0.5 to 0.2 with that of the critical. For concrete structures however, this value can be of the order between 0.5 to 
to 1.5 percent. The hydrodynamic damping generally originates from the radiation damping and the viscous damping effects. Radiation damping is determined using potential theory. The drag damping is lower for structures with larger diameter of column members is about 0.1 percent. The damping ratio of offshore structures that is wet structures including the effects of added mass can be expressed conveniently as a ratio of dry structures as given in the equation below. So, the damping ratio of the wet structure can be expressed as the proportion of the mass of the dry system and the frequency of the dry with respect to the mass of the wet system and the frequency of the wet where m star and omega star are otherwise called generalized mass and frequency respectively. However, the analysis confirms that the total damping ratio in offshore structure is only about 2 percent for the first three modes of bottom supported structures. The other important aspect of load which plays a role in offshore structure is the dead load. Dead load is nothing but the overall weight of the platform in air which includes piling, superstructure, jacket, stiffeners, piping, conductors, corrosion anodes, deck, railing, grout and similar other appurtenances used for drilling and exploration. The dead load includes weight of the drilling equipment placed on the platform which includes the derricks, the draw works, the mud pumps, the mud tanks etcetera. Weight of production or treatment equipments located on platform which includes separators, compressors, piping manifolds and storage tanks. It also includes the weight of drilling that cause variable loads during drilling such as drilling mud, water, fuel and even casing etcetera. Dynamic load sorry dead load also include weight of treatment employed during production such as fluid in the separator, storage in the tanks etcetera. It also includes the drilling load which is approximately a combination of direct load, pipe storage, rotatable load etcetera. Let us talk about the live load which is acting on offshore platforms. Live loads are acting in addition to the equipment loads. Loads caused to impact of vessels and boats on the platform do cause live loads on the platform. Live loads are generally associated with a factor called dynamic amplification factor which will take care of the effects of impact caused by the vessels on the platform members. So, dynamic amplification factor is applied to such kind of loads to compute the enhanced live loads. Live loads are generally designated as some factor times that of applied static load. These factors which are nothing but multipliers to the static load are assigned by the designer in charge depending upon the type of the platform. This table quickly show the typical live load values used in the platform design. There are varieties of live loads which are multiplied uniform deck loads, concentrated deck loads, concentrated loads on the grid beams. There are different areas which are also having different designation of forces as suggested by the international codes for walkway and staircase, for areas above 40 square meter, for areas light in use you have different recommended values given by the international codes. The next one is talking about the impact load. For structural components which experience impact under live loads, the stipulated live load should be multiplied by an impact factor as you see here. Now, the impact factor can cause in additional increase in load both in horizontal and vertical directions. The rated load in cranes can be 20 and 100 percent whereas, support light machinery you have got only multiply a factor of 1.2 and add it only on the vertical component. Whereas, if you are talking about supporting of rotating machinery then you must divide the total additional load equally to horizontal and vertical components. If you have boat landing there is no percentage given straight values are given in the code. The typical deck floor loads where the drilling rig is located varies from 11.95 kilonewton square meter where the derrick area will have a live load of 71.85 kilonewton square meter whereas, the pipe racks, 
power plants living and accommodation areas will have a live load of 47.9 kilo Newton per square meter. Friends, before we move on to the dynamic analysis, let us quickly see a hint on general design requirements. Design methodology of offshore platform differs with different types of offshore structures. For example, in case of fixed structure, the vertical deformation will be lesser because it is bottom supported like jacket platform or GBS. These structures are highly rigid, therefore, they tend to attract more forces. The design criteria share therefore, should be to limit the stresses in the members and not the displacement. The displacement of course, under the members under these applied loads will be quite insignificant. On the other hand, in case of complaint structures as they are more flexible, they are displaced more under wave action. This creates more disturbances in the waves surrounding the platform. The design criteria therefore, will be to control the displacement instead of limiting the stresses in the members. You understand? When you want to talk about design of fixed structures, we talk about membrane stresses or member forces and stresses. Whereas, in complaint structures, we focus on displacement. We must control the displacement compared to that of limiting the stresses. Of course, orientation of platform is another important aspect in the design. The preferred orientation is that members are oriented to have less projected area to the encountered wave direction, but we all agree and understand wave direction is not unique, it is not fixed, wave can vary from any direction. Therefore, the preferred orientation should be symmetric to the wave approach angle. The prominent wave direction for the chosen site is made available to the designer before the platform orientation is desired. To do this, there are different data required by the designer. Land topographic survey of the chosen site, hydrographic survey of the proposed location, hydrographic charts, information regarding silting at the site, wind rose diagram which shows information on wind velocity, duration, predominant direction round the clock the year, cyclonic tracking data which shows details of past cyclonic storm such that the wind velocity, direction, peak velocity period can be calculated. Oceanographic data includes general tide data, tide table, wave data, local current, seabed characteristics, temperature, rainfall and humidity. Seismicity level and values of acceleration are also known to be in advance. The structural data of existing similar structures preferably the near vicinity should also be made available. Most importantly for ground based structures or gravity based systems you have to have a detailed soil investigation reports as well. <laughs> when you talk about analysis of offshore structures there are different stages like execution, installation, in service stages during its lifetime. Many disciplines in analysis are involved structural engineer, geotechnical, naval architect and metallurgists are involved in designing or analyzing offshore structures. Generally prefer people prefer stick models, beam elements assembled in frames extensively for tubular structures like jackets, bridges, barges, flare booms etcetera and lattice test type structures for modules and decks. Each member of the given form geometric form of the platform is normally rigidly fixed at its ends to the other element in the model. For more accuracy particularly for assessment of natural vibration modes local flexibility of the connections may be represented by an equivalent joint stiffness matrix in the analysis. In addition to its geometric and material properties each member is also characterized by hydrodynamic coefficients relating to drag inertia and marine growth and of course, depends on whether you allow wave forces to be automatically generated or not. The integrated deck and hull of floating platforms which involve large bulkheads are described by plate elements in the analysis. Membrane stresses are taken when the element is subjected to a member merely axial load and shear. Verification of an element consists of comparing its characteristic resistance, the design force or stress is done a strength check where the characteristic resistance are related to the yield strength of the member. A stability check is then performed for elements in compression where the characteristic resistance relates to the buckling limit of the member. 
tubular joints are checked against punching and the various load patterns. There is an extensive need for local reinforcement of the cord using over thickness or internal ring stiffeners can also do. Offshore members and elements should be also verified against fatigue, corrosion, temperature and durability wherever it is relevant. If we look at the factors of combination under axial strong axis bending and weak axis bending in normal and extreme C states we generally recommend these multiplying factors. Normal in sense under which the plant is to operate without shutdown, extreme in sense the platform is to endure over its lifetime. So, there is no physical damage or catastrophic damage ensured to the platform in design. When you talk about design then foremost presently in practice is limit state method. There are different limit states, ultimate limit state which corresponds to an ultimate event considering the structural resistance with appropriate reserve. Fatigue limit state corresponds to the possibility of failure and the cyclic loading. Progressive collapse limit state possibly refers to the ability of the structure to resist collapse loads under accidental or abnormal conditions. Service limit states correspond to the criteria for normal use or durability which is often specified by the plant operator. There are different load factors suggested by international codes which I am summarizing here for different kinds of load limit states as you saw in the previous slide. P stands for the permanent loads, L stands for live loads, D stands for deformation loads, E stands for environmental loads and A stands for accidental loads. Possibly you will see the accidental load combination is practically 0 except in the case of accidental loads. There are different conditions that are also specified for various limit state. For example, in case of construction, load out, transport, tow out, launching, lifting, in place and in place extreme, in place exceptional, earthquakes, rare earthquakes, explosions, fire, dropped objects, boat collision and damage structure. We have different P by L <coughs> acceptance of load for different criteria P category, L category, E, D and A category. These categories already explained in the last lecture. So, you should go for what kind of design criteria when you look for construction stage. For example, you should look for ultimate limit state or serviceability limit state etcetera. So, what is the design criteria? What are the construction and condition stages where which analysis is being actually done using various limit states which are explained in the last column. In addition to this offshore platforms are also attracted to fabrication and installation loads. These loads are of course, temporary and arise only during fabrication and erection of the platform and to their components. According to DNV rules the return period for computing design environmental conditions for installation and fabrication loads is approximately about 3 times or that of the duration of the corresponding phase. APRP 2A on the other hand leaves the design return period to the owner or the designer. BS 6235 recommends a minimum recurrence interval of 10 years for the design environmental loads associated with transportation of the structure to the offshore site. In addition to this as we employ cranes on the top side we also have to bother about the lifting forces. Lifting forces or functions of weight of the structural component being lifted, the number of the components being lifted and the location of the lifting I for where are you lifting it, the angle between the each sling and the vertical axis and the condition under which the lift is performed. Factor of 2 is generally applied to all the members and connections for designing for lifting forces and 1.35 for all secondary members. For load out at sheltered locations the corresponding minimum load factor for both the group of structural components or respectively 1.5 and 1.15. The figure on the right shows different kinds of drilling operations as well as the lifting forces which are encountered on the platform. When you load out a platform module for commissioning the load out forces need to be calculated. These forces are generally generated when the jacket is loaded 
from the fabrication yard onto the barge what we call as load out stage. The typical values of friction coefficients for calculation of skidding force or namely steel on steel without lubrication is 0.25, steel on steel with lubrication is 0.15, steel on Teflon is 0.1, Teflon to Teflon is the lowest load out force which is 0.08 because there is no friction between them. The table on the right side will give you what are the different drafts and displacements of the load out and what would be the weight transferred on the barge in terms of tons and what is the progress of the jacket in terms of load out operation. In addition there can be some transportation forces which are generated when the platform components are transported offshore on barges or meant for slip floating. This operation need to be planned carefully by considering the following requirements. <coughs> One should know the previous experience along the tow route, the exposure time should be based upon the weather window, the accessibility of safe havens should be always calculated, seasonal weather system should be considered before you plan for transportation forces, appropriate return period for determining the design wind, wave and current conditions should be calculated, this should take into account the characteristics of the tow such as size, structure, sensitivity and cost. The other kind of force which occurs in offshore platform is launching and appending forces. We already know that appending is the process by which after launching the platform or the jacket is erected vertically. Forces are generated during the launch of the platform from the barge into the sea and during the subsequent appending into its proper vertical position to rest on the seabed. Accident loads is the last category of loads which are acting on the offshore structure. According to DNV rules, accident loads are ill defined with respect to their intensity and frequency which may occur as a result of accident or exceptional circumstances. Accident loads are loads due to collision with vessels, fire or explosion and caused by drop objects unintended flooding of buoyancy tanks can also result in accidental loads. Accidental loads can be disregarded if its annual probability of occurrence is less than 10 power minus 4. The estimate of order of magnitude and the time period of accidental load is extremely difficult to compute and therefore, only thumb rules are being used to calculate accidental loads on offshore platforms. We have discussed different kinds of load phenomena, different source of loads, different spectra, different governing equations based on which these forces on the offshore members can be calculated. So, with this background one should be able to understand how, what are the environmental forces acting on the offshore members, how are they calculated, how are they distributed along the height in the superstructure, along the depth in the substructure. Thank you very much. <coughs>